Well, welcome. My name is Scott Walter. I'm executive director here at the Kickapoo Valley Reserve for just about a year now. Came on last summer. So a few things to say and then I'll turn it over to these uh, intrepid young men for the presentation. The first thing, and we preface each of our talks now uh, with this, is our land acknowledgement statement. The Kickapoo Reserve Management Board acknowledges that the state and federal lands that comprise the reserve fall within the ancestral homelands of First Nations people, including the Ho-Chunk Nation. We recognize the sovereignty of the Ho-Chunk and other First Nations and will work towards a shared future by continuing to create cl collaborative opportunities to protect and preserve these lands. The other thing I'd like to say, since many of you are regular Driftless Dialogue attendees, this lecture series, which is a highlight of my month, we have so many good talks, so much good information gets brought out out here to the Kickapoo through the, the series. But it's, it's uh, provided by a grant through the Ralphie Newsom Kickapoo Reforestation Fund, which is administered through the College of Egg and Life Sciences down in Madison. And our intrepid friends group, the Friends of the Kickapoo Valley Reserve, also supports it with the uh, the refreshments, et cetera. So I hope you enjoy it. I have to give one little uh, uh, bit of a side note here as introduction. That who's read Kickapoo Pearls? The book itself, so a handful. So my dad was a very proud Kickapoojan who ended up moving away for a number of years. When I was somewhere in the middle school era uh, age, Kickapoo pearls showed up on our coffee table, and I just became fascinated with these stories that harken back to my dad's childhood, my grandma's childhood, my ancestors' roots here in the valley. So I'm excited to have two folks here, very knowledgeable, Chuck Hatfield, Brad Steinmetz, to revisit Kickapoo pearls. So, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> We were actually um, going to be talking um, about Kickapoo Pearls a little later um, because we really kind of want to get into the publishing of, of books that the Friends of the Kickapoo Valley Reserve um, almost took on from their inception. And in almost every case, the, the <coughs> publications were saving the stories. They were about um, saving the history of this area, and um, and we had we have, we're going to actually talk about a number of books before we get to the pearls, which we're we're going to finish with. But the the friends, which is now 20 years old, I guess, um, almost from its inception, um, went into publishing these stories and w in doing so they were um, involved in a, a variety of, of ways of doing it. And we're going to be talking a little bit about that. We're going to be talking about how the publications came to be and then especially with this guy over here how the printing <laughs> and putting the book together and all of that kind of thing happened which was which was really his, his expertise. And so we're going to begin to, tonight with looking at The People Remember. And The People Remember was uh, published in 2004 and was the first publishing project of the, of the Friends. And we have two different copies of this. I have the paperback copy. And Chuck has the hard copy there. And this came about because of an oral history project that was done in 2000, 2001, which was Chuck and I were both involved with, in which um, interviews were done with people that had been affected by the Lafarge Dam project. Um, specifically aimed at former landowners, but then also looking at um, people in the village, in the area, who had been affected by uh, the project. 
And um, that generation of people who had sold their properties for the, for the dam project back in the 60s and 70s was leaving us. And so it was very important to try and get out there and get their stories. And to be honest, a lot of them did not want to talk to us. There was still a lot of bad feelings. And um, when we approached them, they said, no, we don't want to bring that up again. Um, many of them were, when, many of them we did interview were very reserved, taciturn, almost didn't want to talk about it, even though we, they were being interviewed. But we did get over 50 interviews, and the process that we used was adults like Chuck and students from one of my classes who had been trained to do the interviewing um, went out and talked to the people and got whatever they could from them. And then we did that for four or five months, and then in the spring, of 2001, we had presentations um, that was put together with the students, many of them who had actually been part of the interviewing, doing a kind of choral presentation out of material that was in the interviews. And we did one up at Brookwood schools, we did one at Lafarge schools. And then the third one we did at the community temple in Lafarge, and that night, the temple was filled to capacity. And the students put this presentation on, and they were using the actual words of the people uh, that were interviewed. And it got very emotional. I can remember I was kind of introduced it before the students started their choral presentation. And as they were giving it, I was kind of sitting off to the side, and I was looking out into the audience, and one of the students in the class, who was a, kind of the scribe, wrote up all the articles for the papers about it. She's looking at me with her eyes like, like this. She goes like this, and I look to the person next to her, and they're crying. And it's one of the people that used to let, own land out here. And then I started looking down the road, and she's not the only one. And so that emotion that came out that night just kind of propelled the project forward. And we knew we had to get these stories in some kind of a format where people could read about that and see that. And so a year later, um, Bonnie Sterling, who wrote for the Broqua Broadcaster Censor at the time, started doing um, pieces from the, she would pick an interview and she would go through it and she would pull out the best lines and about every month she would have like a page or two full pages of, of those interviews and they were immensely popular. And Bonnie was also very close to the Friends, would become a board member of the Friends here. And so we just thought, wow, she's on to something here. And so we reached out to her and, and said, you know, could we, could we do something with, your, with these interviews that you've published and put it in a book form or something? And she did 15 of them. We put all 15 in this book plus four others. And we're not exactly sure what, what the four others, why the other four, except one of them was Henry Trapp, who I had interviewed a couple years after the project ended. And we're on basically that farm. So, I mean, that was an important person to, to interview. And so, um, the friends kind of took it on. How can, we, how can we publish something like this? to get this out to people, these stories about this. Uh, here's another thing, by the way. Once that 
that evening down at the community temple when we did that presentation, we had all kinds of former landowners come back to us and said, I'd like to tell my story now. Because they understood what we were trying to do and how important it was to get their stories told. So, Chuck, you want to tell us how we published the book? <laughs> well, it, it, you can see edited by uh, um, Bonnie. Bonnie Sterling took the, took the lead because she had more experience in publishing uh, anything than, than the rest of us did. And, uh, and so she had a, um, she had a friend who, um, who had, she had worked with on, on a small project. And so that friend had a publishing company and she said, that, and that person said, I'll, sure, I'll, I'll help you out. And, um, and so it was, it was the first experience, I think, as far as the board was concerned, or the, the especially the, the committee, Brad and I, we really didn't have much experience in, in the publishing world. So this was kind of our education, and, and uh, it moved slowly um, and expensively. You find out that, that publishing, especially if you hire a publisher, is, uh, is expensive, uh, but you get what you pay for. So uh, it, for us to do it, it would have been a kind of stapled at the corner kind of effort, <laughs> and, uh, and it would never have lasted uh, it, like this, like <laughs> this has. So, uh, so nevertheless, it was published, and, and I think published in a very attractive, uh, this, this book is very attractive. Um, how, many, how many people were interviewed? I think it ended up being almost 70. Yes. And at the time I think we did this, we had at least 50 some uh, interviews available. Yeah. But these interviews are only a part of what, every, what uh, each person said. Their interviews are tape, were, were recorded and they were tape recorded back in those days. They were tape recorded and they, were, uh, and they still are stored at the, uh, the Area Research Center at uh, the University of Wisconsin-La Crosse. And so every one of these, the, people, the stories that are in here, are much, much longer. What she decided to do was to take these stories, which, which were basically stories about how did you feel, how did you react, what happened when you were told that your land was going to be either bought forcibly or taken from you if you resist. And, and, and then how did that feel? that taking of your land. And so that was kind of the core of it. But when you interviewed people, they wanted to also talk about their farm. And they talked about, uh, when, in the interview that I had, um, it was a, the son of the person who owned the farm. And they were older at that time. But right at the end of the interview, I, I thought we were closing it up. And so I'm thanking him for it. And he said, there's just one, one more thing I want to tell you. My little brother is buried on that little knoll just off above the Kickapoo next to our house. He was stillborn and I remember the whole family getting up in the night and, and walking with this baby out to this really beautiful, you know, the, you know the places, the beautiful uh, knolls, rock knolls over the Kickapoo and, and he said, that was hard for us to walk away from because it was, it was like leaving a part of our, our family behind. Um, but that story, as it turns out, was a story that was repeated in other ways. People walked away from a whole lot. And, and so that's what these stories are about. They're, it's about loss. It's about, it's about reclaiming. Many of them talk about, about um, sort of reclaiming the, uh, the life that they had or perhaps going in uh, a brand new direction. So uh, in the end, we couldn't afford him. So, um, so we, started, we started writing letters and we wrote to, of all people, the found, same foundation, right, that, that, uh, that is sponsoring this tonight, the Newsom, 
Newsom, what, Newsom grants anyway. And that's the seed money that we have used to publish ever since, is that uh, Newsom's provided us with a, with a budget, which, uh, which we have been able to work with for uh, all these years, these 20 years since, and publish several of the books that you see here. So, um, and to do a lot of other things, including learning how to publish. So. And that initial grant from the Newsom Fund paid for all of the publishing costs. So that the friends, when they were selling this book, were making 100% profit. 100%. Which was pretty nice. It's a pretty good deal. And that, there, there are some people who didn't know that, and so they kind of resented the fact that these books are laying around and they're not getting money for them, or, or uh, they didn't realize that, that uh, these, were, these were already paid for and uh, that, that they just received the, uh, the benefit of the money for them. So we move on then. And by the way, if you have any questions while we're going through this, just ask. Hi. Yes. Could you, for the benefit of people who haven't lived here all their life, just quickly recap the Kickaboo Dam project? Can you do it? Ah, no. You're, you're wrong. We cannot quickly do that. <laughs> uh, the dam project um, the was. Now. Repeat the question, please. We'll the, yeah, yes. The question was a, a, a brief history of the dam project. And the dam project was initiated to provide flood control initially was going to start in the early 1960s and um, eventually it grew into not only having a dam across the river here for flood control but then having an 1800 acre lake for recreation and that type of thing um, for a number of reasons and i always say economic environmental and governmental Re, uh, reasons the project was stopped. But that was only after the dam was three quarters completed, 140 families or individuals had to sell their land to the federal government for the project. And then it sat out here, this land, what became known as the government land, sat out here for 25, 30 years before the reserve was created. So there's a, there's a really long period of, of ill feeling about the whole thing. And there was attempts to put in a dry dam and there was all kinds of, there was suits to bring, get the land back to the original people, and all that kind of stuff, but. Isn't there a timeline of that on, um I don't know if it was the Kickapoo Reserve. Yeah. The, but there is a documented timeline that Al Anderson put together. Yeah. Think, yeah. yeah. That's true. Yeah. So apparently I have to do this by myself now. <laughs> <laughs> As Mr. Hatfield left. <laughs> Other questions? Anything else? The second book that um, the Friends published was this book. And I know some of you, I saw, were looking at it, and a lot of people don't know very much about this book at all. This is, we call this the Gems book. And it was published in 2007 by the, by the Friends. And the amazing thing about this book is that it was totally out of print. No, nobody hardly knew anything about this book. And it was, something that the friends here at the reserve were going to revitalize. I mean, it was, this, this particular project was gone. Oh, you're back. <laughs> well, let, let me, let me okay. say that the best book ever written about the damn project <laughs> was written by Brad, <laughs> and he's too shy to bring it out for you. But I'm not, because this is, this is really the first real attempt by anybody who knew really knew about it from all sides, um, what happened with the dam. And so 
this book is available through the uh, to the friends as well. That it's a, it's for sale out there too. Yeah, that damn history. <laughs> so I've introduced your gems. Yes, yes. Uh, um, and it, you, did you tell when it was actually produced? No, in the I first didn't. place. I haven't in, in 1896, these two women, these two elderly women uh, from Biola, from Biola. Uh, decided that there needed to be, that they lived in this beautiful driftless area, which of course it wasn't that, but you had to have a handle to produce some kind of aura around the Kikpu Valley. And because as they start out in the beginning of it, they said that, this, that the Kikpu Valley had a reputation of, uh, it was a list of things. Scoundrels, like scoundrels outlaws. Outlaws, horse thieves. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Um, unchurched, uh, uncivilized, yes. I mean, it was just, and that's the reputation, and they said they are so wrong, and we are setting out to correct the record. And so these ladies then, this is like a, this is like a, a, uh, a promotion, like a, um, like somebody who, who is uh, from the, the uh, tourist bureau or something is, <laughs> is promoting. And so even the name, the Kiku Valley, the gem of Wisconsin, the, a brief history of the Kikwu Valley, its early settlement, progress and development, illustrated with half-tone engravings of buildings, sceneries, representative men, <laughs> two women, yes, <laughs> etc. Gertrude Fraser and Rose B. Poff. And, and these women actually had a, a life of their own, and the, both of them went on to become uh, even better known. And um, so, so the book itself was, uh, was written by them in 1896. And then, and then uh, we just came across that somebody gave this to me. This was an attempt to publish it, uh, to republish it because it had long since. And if I don't know if you can see this, but you see the the Scotch tape around the big cover. Because the only copy that we could find to make our book from, and we wanted to make it from a real book, not from like this one. This was a this was a paste up. They, they just uh, took pages out of a book and they're not very good copies. So, so we found somebody that had a book and it was all taped together. And so we, we deconstructed that and we included, when we photographed it, we photographed it with the tape and, and all. It just seemed really important to, to show that this is, a, this is not the original copy. But this was a treasured copy of somebody who has had dog-eared it and, and used it for all that time. So it's a, it is a very, very nice copy. And, and, um, and they preach the gospel so well that when you finish this, you say, I'm going to drive to Biola and <laughs> <laughs> kick who said her. Whoa, I'm going to go see kick up. Yeah, and of course, much of what they talked about doesn't really exist. But, um, and this book really was entirely lost. I mean, it, was. it, it had not, it was never republished after the, after the two ladies re originally did it. And one of, the, one of the ladies who did it was running the newspaper in Viola at the time. And, and then Mrs. Poff had been at that meeting up in La Crosse where the minister was damning the Kickapoo, you know, and, and, and you know, don't, and he was actually raising funds to send missionaries yes. down to the King of the Valley. <laughs> he was, because there were no churches, there were no schools. It was, it was a den of inequity, all, inequity, all of that kind of thing. And they set out to prove him wrong. And, it, and they, they, interestingly, the photos in there are done by the photographer from Viola that was, had a studio there, marvelous stuff that, that, that is in the book. He went along with them and they go to, town to town and talk to people and get stories and, and, and it was all gone. As a matter of fact, when Chuck brought this up, I had never heard of this book. I just didn't even know about it. And then we were fortunate in that Brian Turner had a copy of, I think it wasn't it Joyce Blackmore's or yes. somebody in yes. Rockton. Yeah. And uh, he said, well, we could use that. So rather than try to, you know, modernize it in any way, we just tried to go with what it looked like 
you know, <laughs> after all these years out of print. And I, I will read it because it's worth, it's worth listening to. I'm, I'm just going to read this short part about this is what the author has had to say. The writers obtained the information presented in this book by visiting personally each and every place mentioned and interviewing the oldest inhabitants, the dates and statistics being the most reliable that could be provided. The Kikwu Valley and its inhabitants have an established unsavory reputation extending throughout the state of Wisconsin and even beyond that, it is a territory some 50 miles long, wild and undeveloped, inhabited by illiterate people who are designated timber thieves, horse thieves, and desperados. <laughs> that such statements are wholly false, we will prove by indisputable evidence herein. This is like a, like a, like a legal brief. <laughs> um, the engravings where we present to the reader will give some idea of the development, the enterprise, and industry, and progression of the inhabitants of this far famed and much abused Kickapoo region. That this book shall be an instrument in removing the great ignorance and prejudice which prevails even among people of our own state, and if it shall convey to our people and those of other states a true knowledge of this region, the end for which we have worked will have been accomplished. In gathering material for this edition, we have been assisted by citizens all along the valley in many ways, and aside from this, we have some contributions herein which are valuable acquisitions of this effort. Acknowledgement is hereby made for all the favors and our sincere wish that this book may fulfill, at least in a measure, the expectations of all our friends who have wished it success, the authors. Yeah. Very interesting. And, and we, we chose to do the book uh, also by, uh, by using a professional scanning process rather than, than trying to scan it on our computers and, and so on. And we're really happy we did. The, the, we started a relationship with a book publishing company at that point, or a book printing, and uh, we were the publishers for it. So uh, United Graphics out of Chicago. And, uh, and they did a number of books for us and we're, we're happy to take on our kind of homemade projects and, uh, yeah. and carry them to the end. So that was a success, and at the same time as that book was being brought out, the GEMS book was being brought out, we were also working on our third book, which came out the next year, which was the Newsom book. And this is here on the Kickapoo, and other stories about a unique relationship with the Kickapoo Valley by Ralph E. Newsom. So Ralph Newsom was a, uh, a businessman, first and foremost, who ran the Newsom Yards up and down the Kickapoo Valley. But he loved the Kickapoo Valley, and he was also a prolific writer, and he loved to write. He, he would, there would be ads in the local papers every week called the Newsom News, and he would write them. And you would read those ads, maybe to see what Newsom was selling, but really to see what Ralph Newsom was talking about. What was the latest that he was going to get, you know, get into. Um, for almost 20 years, he also, each year, at the end of the year, around Christmas time, he wrote these little books that were um, put together and um, given out at Christmas time as presents to friends, family, and customers. And many of these books were about the Kickapoo Valley. For instance, this one is called The Lazy Crazy Old Kickapoo. And Ralph Newsom loved this valley, uh, not only because he made lots of money at his lumber yards here, but also because he and his family kind of he they kind of grown up in, on the west branch of the Kickapoo, and then he was over here a lot because of the businesses, and he just loved the 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 people, and he also loved the beautiful valley. And he talks about that in a lot of these books. So what we did was we went to the family, the Newsom family, and we asked 
could we take some of these and put them together and come up with a new book? And they said, yes, go ahead. And um, gave us the permission. We went through these and figured out which ones we were going to put in. And we put in uh, six, which were pretty much about the King including, Valley. Including the lazy, crazy old one. Yeah, the lazy, crazy old one is the last chapter in this. And um, I wrote an introduction about Ralph Newsom and who he was and what he was all about and his good points and bad points. I remember interviewing Ralph Newsom's secretary who typed up all of this stuff. And she said that by September, he would have these stories pretty much kind of lined up as to how they were going to go. And so she would start typing on it and she would just get it going. And then the next day he would come in and by the way, we've got to change something. <laughs> and of course, this is when you're just working on a typewriter. You just can't erase, you know, and that kind of thing. So, oh, okay. And he'd say, now try this version. And so uh, she told me that by, by the time December 1st hit, when they would have to get these things printed up to hand out, um, she might be in her sixth, seventh version of, of what this was going to be, you know. And uh, she, was, she was almost hated to go to work during those times, <laughs> or, or at least see him, because he might say, by the way, we've got to change something. So, But I mean, the family was very much behind us. We had a program where we presented this book, invited all of the family to come in, and uh, grandchildren and great-grandchildren and, and or, or, I mean, cousins and nephews and all of these Newsoms came in and were just kind of blown away with this. And so, again, publishing-wise, it was the first time that we actually had done a from scratch book. Yeah. Uh, we had both of the others. Uh, I mean, this one, we had somebody professional doing the book for us with the material that we provided. The, uh, the uh, second book right there, The Gem. Gems. The Gem, we had a book and we just reprinting it. Reprinted with a, with a new foreword and, and some other things. So this was our first attempt to do something of our own with kind of a completely original. And, uh, and so, uh, and I have to say that I, I, it went well, it went well. This was, it's a smaller book, it's a kind of compact and, uh, and it's delightful reading. And we and he did how many of these? Like fifty or sixty of these books? I don't know. I it's, thought it was more like twenty or thirty. Oh no, it's it's a. I think it's a bigger number than oh, that. Okay. But yeah. But some of them we couldn't print. No. <laughs> because they were not sensitive about issues that we should be sensitive about today, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and about other things that he had. He was very opinionated about things. This is a man who was larger than life. Yes. And he and he uh, he was larger than Kikou Valley, really, and 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 his money is still funding things like this and many many other very important things. Uh, and he was generous, and uh, but a very complicated, very interesting person. And we were happy to to do this book uh, about him. If you want to know more about Ralph Newsom, all of the information that John received when he owned Newsom's. Um, I gave it to the Historical Society in Brokaw, and then um, Ralph's brother owned the other news yes. in, in Hillsboro, so they have kind of a separate history. Yes. Um, but, um, yes, so the historical, historical Society, Vernon County Historical Society in Brokaw, has all of these and lots of information on Ralph Newsom and, and 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 the other Newsom stores because it was a it was a it was a big family that operated um, lumber yards all over western Wisconsin, and Ralph was was part of that. We yes. have them at the library. Yeah, also. I think okay. so. I, mean, I don't know. We don't have all of them, but we have yeah. pretty good collections. Of yeah, the Farge Library has a lot of these too. So they really are very interesting reading and very well done, by the way, too. Right. You know, I, I wondered is such a prominent name for. Yes. He was he was not married. Oh, so he was a bachelor. 
a confirmed bachelor. And, um, but he's, his brothers and uh, sisters had all kinds of family. So yes, and they are still around, yes. His, his sister, Priscilla, who's a is Henry Peterson's mom, and Henry was in um, Hillsborough. Okay. Yeah. And he yeah. just sold his lovely art to Ross Carpenter. So. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and Priscilla, I think, wrote a book also, I think. Um, I don't remember the library ever going Yeah. Ahead. Well, there's but one of the. Uh, another thing to point out too about Ralph Newsom is that he left all of his money to the University of Wisconsin, Madison. And to get money out of that fund, you have to have a relationship with a professor there oh, yes. in order right. to yes. tap yes. into those news of funds. So. But we've, we've worked that out. And yeah. So we have, I mean, as an example, that money that he left to University of Wisconsin is providing this Driftless Dialogue series, again, for us to talk about books and history and stories of the people of the Kickapoo Valley. So. Um, yeah, that was, that was a really interesting project, which leads us to our, our last project, which is really kind of why we're talking about these tonight, which is the um, Kickapoo Pearls. And uh, when we, when we, and we did not write the Kickapoo Pearls. The Friends did not do that. What the Friends did was the Kickapoo Pearls, which originally came out in tabloid size newspapers, this size. And there were four of them. There were actually, there were actually going to be three of them. And they came out in 1979 as part of the Kickapoo Valley history project that was being done at that time. And again, it's going out and interviewing people and getting their stories and getting photos and all kinds of really interesting things that was being done for this history project. But every month for four months, they printed up a copy of this Kickapoo Pearls and kind of threw it out to the public so they could kind of see what they were doing. And the, the first copy that went out I, I don't know, was, was put out in, in June, and I missed it. And so the next one was put out the following month, in July of 79. And so, oh, run to town and get my copy of the Kickapoo Pearls. And uh, one thing led to another, and I got there a little late. They were gone. <laughs> and you, these things just flew off the shelf. I mean, people... You know, and they reprinted and all of this kind of thing. So the, the pearls, eventually, they put the, when they finished the history project, they took the remaining copies, made more copies of the original tabloid size, and they put them in a folder like this, really nice picture of logging up on Warner Creek back in the day. And then, you know, you had your thing on the side here. Well, by 2010, when we started looking at this project, these were all falling apart. And everybody was looking to see, you know, where you could find these. Um, estate sales, man, these things just, they were gone immediately. And they were written on newsprint. Yeah, it's, you know, so yes. it's really. So they're yellowed and cracked. Yeah, and, and it really fragile. deteriorated fast. And so again, we had to come up with a new publishing project. Before we actually get into that with Chuck, I, I would like to mention that this was a bigger project than just the Kickapoo Pearls. The Kickapoo Valley Association got uh, federal grants and they did a number of things. First of all, they had a river cleanup project. The very first one that was taken on after canoeing became popular. And I can remember when they did it, there was some resentment because the pro dam people said, oh yeah, you clean that river up and the, the canoeists will come and, and then we'll never get that dam finished. And you know, there was all of that kind of stuff going on. But, 
they and they not only cleaned up the river from Ontario, I think all the way down to Reedstown, extensively cleaned up the river, so it would be better for canoeing, but they also developed trails along the river and um, boat landing sites where you could get your canoes on and off. This is before kayaks, so um, you know that's kind of what we're looking at at that time. But it was a big, big project that they spent uh, uh, two, about two years on cleaning up the river. They also did an agricultural survey, which was to communicate with landowners here in the Kickapoo Valley about watershed problems, solutions, specifically talking about flooding. And you know, how do you, how do you, how do you deal with that? Like, move away from the river, but. There was an energy alternatives project. Uh, this book called Kickapoo Sunrise um, comes out of that project. And after this 1978 flood, Soldiers Grove got really interested in alternative power supplies because they were going to move their whole downtown away from the Kickapoo. And they basically became the first solar town in America. And it really came out of the work of these individuals. And, um, you know, there's a number of them, they talk about them on here. But that was part of this project that was being done through these grants. And it was also um, very important that some people don't even realize that it's tied in with that. And then there was the history project. And the history project was going to be a, a folk history, oral history program. They wanted to do maybe 100 interviews, and they ended up doing 140. They really got into it. Um, they were going to create study units that you could use in teaching schools and, and uh, different things like that. They were going to put out the pearls, so to convey the information to the public. They were going to make a documentary film, which eventually was completed. It's called Land of the Crooked River. Land of the Crooked River. And, um, the real one is on a reel about like this, uh, yeah. 16 <laughs> millimeter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then they were going to do a Kickapoo Valley history textbook for students, for schools um, to use. Um, which was never completed. Um, its material is laying there, but the project just never actually um, did get done. But um, we want to talk about the pearls because especially the effort of the friends to get a new version of this put out, a version that would last that people would want to, you know, could have, you could put it off on the co coffee table and it would last <laughs> type of thing. And um, so, go. Well, first of all, you notice that this is an unusual book. Um, librarians cuss books like this because they will not fit any shelves in any position. You can't even lay them down and, and put them in. And it's a giant book. And, and if you reduced it, which we thought some about that, if you reduce it, you reduce uh, type and, and other illustrations and everything to a point where they're not very effective, and in fact, kind of eye straining, and re it would reduce the impact of the, of the book itself. So our idea was, um, and, and so you carry this to a printer or to a, to a publisher, or, and in this case, we were looking for a printer because we were the publisher. And, and, and you say, uh, we'd like to make, a, make uh, you know, maybe two or 300 copies of this. And they said, well, good luck. <laughs> 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 we, we actually could find somebody who would print this, but they're the people who print signs and, and, and large format kinds of things. They don't do books. And even if you got it into a book you know, some, you found somebody who, could, who would print all those pages for you. Nobody would bind it because there's, there's only one binder who binds this kind of stuff, and they're in Minneapolis. And, and uh, so good luck in that. So uh, it happened that I was, I was working with, um, with a book that 
that myself and some teachers were publishing, and it was a, a textbook uh, to use in, in science classrooms. And, and I was using this guy who was really good. He was a publisher, but he was also a, a problem solver because we had lots of unusual things expected for him to do as well. And so we, I went to him and he said, let me work on this. I think we can do it. And he came back not very long after that and he said, we can. We can, we can do this exactly the way you want it. It'll be, in, it'll be a, 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 this exact same size. It will be done on good paper. The cover will be a heavy format and slick and waterproof and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and, and we can do it without costing you an arm and a leg. And so uh, he did. He did that for us. And, and, uh, that, and the Newsom's money then brought us in. I think we ordered a hundred copies of that first one because the sticker shock hit the uh, friends group when when you s multiply it like twenty five dollars by by a hundred, you know it it gets into like four digits and and so we only did a hundred to start with and then of course we ran out quickly and then we've had to order uh, several times since. And and once we started on this project. Some of the people who had worked on this oral history project heard about it, and they were very interested in helping us with their stories and how that had gone and, and, and in the different parts of that process. So as we were putting this new version of this together, we wrote an introduction, a new introduction for it, talking about those people talking about the ones who had worked on this oral history project. And um, we decided to have a reunion of them, to have them, as many as we could get, to come as, as we released this book and get them all together and talk about that process. And um, it was very successful. Almost all of the people, um, a couple couldn't make it, but there was, there was like a dozen people that came to that reunion and just started to, to talk about that whole process. And the, the thing I find very unique about, uh, about the Kickapoo Pearls, it's, it's not Lafarge based. It, it runs from Walton in the north all the way to Wazika in the south. You have stories in there about farms and about people and jobs and ways of living um, over the years in the Kickapoo Valley. And there's all these different stories and it's just an amazing collection. Every time I kind of sit down with this and I went, as I was going through this, I just opened it up to a page and I haven't read that. <laughs> and so I just sat and read it and it's such a, such an interesting story. Kind of my preference in the book was uh, the interviews they did with the Morgan family in Lafarge. And the Morgan family was a family that worked for the Kickapoo Valley Railroad. And they ended up living in Lafarge. Um, and um, they interviewed two different brothers who had worked for the railroad. Their father had worked for the railroad. As a matter of fact, died working for the railroad, trying to uh, clean out flood trash at the bridge down at Tunnelville after one of the big bridges, or after one of the big floods and trying to clean out the, the trash from the railroad bridge and he fell in and drowned. I mean, it was just, a, it was so interesting to hear them tell that particular story, but there were those kinds of stories from people in Wilton and Ontario and, and Gays Mills, just all over that were telling these stories as what it was like to, to be growing up in the Kickapoo Valley during the Great Depression and things like that. And, and how farming, how you farmed in these, um, as it would speak, speak of today, you know, these poor Kickapoo Valley farms. How you made it, how you made it and how you dealt with the river flooding and all of that kind of thing. So it's, it's, uh, it, was, it was a fantastic history project. And then when we took on the printing of it, 
the reunion of that crew that had worked on it was just very interesting to, to hear from all those people. Who was that crew? Huh? Was the first group of people that are noted in that or worked on it? Yeah, the first. Who, who, who were the first? Oh, Dan Umirian and Tom Hovde was the, was the um, kind of boss. ran the show. Yeah, he ran okay. the show. And Frances Burton was the videographer. And she went on actually to, to work out of Chicago and work on documentaries. Um, so um, she continued to work in that field. Uh, Dan Amurian, he mentioned Margaret Lee. You remember yeah, Maggie Margaret, Lee yeah, from, yeah. from okay. here? She was on that in the group. Okay. Dale Murray from down uh, Soldiers mm -hmm. Grove or Gaze, Gaze Mills maybe. Uh, and Dale came and, and Dana Strobel uh, both of those came to uh, to our uh, um, our party, our reunion, our reunion, Kickapoo Pearls reunion, and then Lon Reuter, who committed suicide soon after, I think, um, and uh, Mike Wright, Judy Wilmus. Judy Wilmus yeah. was very well known south of here. She was she was one of the stream monitors in the beginning of kind of the the, the conservation that conservation movement uh, in the early 2000s. Um, Jean Muller, yeah. also from here. Sean Donovan, you, that's a familiar name, uh, went on to be principal and other things here. And uh, so who else did I miss? I think so that's... They, it wasn't necessarily the KVA then? It was just a group of people? No. Well, the KVA hired them. Oh, Yeah, I see. they hired them using that grant money. And they set up offices in the Farge. Okay. Remember. remember that? Yeah. And so, yeah, they and they just kind of branched out and... And it's interesting, we have a set of cards that, that Tom Hovde had given Chuck, and there are no cards with ideas on people you could talk to, oh. and what they knew, and what story they may want to tell. And it's really interesting, and there's some from Lafarge, and some from all, you know, all over, and just you turn it over, and then this person will know something about farming and you know different things like it was that. so slick it was before computers you know yeah. so you, you, you yeah. turned them around and you look yeah. on the other side and there was other information on it and then yeah. you filed them in alphabetical <laughs> order and wow it was just yeah. amazing yeah, let me just there are some other names here that i should get out here david craig wazika but bernard smith yeah. you know who, yeah. who's yeah. and Jeannie smith who is an author in her own right and did a whole lot of nature stuff dale muller you know very famous for the writings and things that that he did and his son is still writing arlene obert uh, yeah. from valley and hillsborough and and uh, um, ran the root beer stand uh, beauty view um, helen uh, chikulski and i don't know who she is uh, uh, Steve Picus, 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 um, and I don't know where he's from, Bell Center. Connie Stevens, Connie was uh, from Viroqua, and, and uh, I think she was at one point the president of the Historical Society and maybe other things mm -hmm. there. Um, uh, Kate Walter, uh, Kate Walter. Oh, yeah. So there was a lot of there was a lot of people that worked on it. I mean, so the, there were those people there were helping with the interviewing. Where that first group we talked about were actually putting things together and teaching classes and and um, and and putting the pearls together and that kind of thing. So, so this was before computers. So just take a look at these and just imagine first of all that everything you see in here was cut and pasted and, and, and laid up by hand. And, and there were, they had books with little cut out, uh, little cut out things that, um, let's see, like, like here. See the little trees? Mm -hmm. <laughs> they put this together in, in church basements mostly throughout the, they yeah. worked in Lafarge in a Methodist church and, 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 and they would meet uh, and sometimes, almost every night, they would meet and when they getting close to a deadline, and they would all get together and they'd just start cutting and pasting, putting in these little, <laughs> little funny yeah. little things, and uh, and putting pictures in, and and do you know who this is? <laughs> Does she look familiar? <laughs> well, actually, she's on the in the internet, and she has a fame all of her own because she's been used by a lot of people for this. Kind of, if you're looking for that exotic indigenous look, 
And they had no idea who she is either. <laughs> and, and they called, you know, they called her kind of variously, uh, you know, like, uh, like Miss Kickapoo or, or Princess Kickapoo or something like that. But they just found a picture and they fell in love with her. So she's used, she's used at the beginning of almost all of their, the, the, whenever they're writing a, uh, uh, the letters, the letter section or the editorials and things like that. Um, so this was so hands-on made. And, uh, and, and, a, and I would say probably a, a, a work of love because these people not only were, they were, they were uh, not only government employees, so to speak, they were, they were, um, um, they had a religious zeal about their work. This was important. What they were doing was really important. They were telling a story that n people would never hear if it wasn't for them. And they felt really empowered and important. And, uh, and, they, and you can feel it in everything, in everything that they wrote. So it's, a, it's, a, it's just really a delight to read uh, not only <coughs> what they wrote, but what they, what they went through, what the pictures and everything else that they added to it. Chuck, did, did they earn a salary through the grants, or was this all volunteer? Yes, yeah, no. The, the original group that was brought in that put the pearls together, they were, it was a job. Okay. And, they, and they worked on it. Now, the, some of those people like Dale Muller and others, um, they volunteered and did interviewing to help with the project. It was a CETA project, so it was, it was funded by CETA. And therefore, it had all sorts of layers of bureaucracy mm -hmm. and, involved, and and accounting mm -hmm. for the money and whatever. But but uh, so it was it was like a a, a part time or even a full time job for for many of these people at a time when when uh, inflation was going gangbusters and and uh, unemployment was picking up. So mm -hmm. so that was the fourth, I guess, and more or less final. <laughs> printing project by their friends here at the reserve and again um, that book basically can only be purchased here I mean it you don't find them anywhere no, no, they and they, they ran out and Chuck just had uh, last year um, find out if he could get it printed again and it was are we going to be able to do it and, and the guy who printed it for us last had gone out of business and, uh, but he went back into business because <laughs> just long enough to do this because he had he still had all of the digital files mm -hmm. for it. Which if you hadn't didn't have the digital files, you'd have to start from scratch. And then he went out again, and and the person the people who did the large format uh, uh, binding were also out of business. So he had to he had to shop around and find somebody to do that, which he did. And he produced them for actually a little cheaper than what we got him. Um, what, how many years ago? Mm -hmm. 15 years ago, something like that. Can you still get it? So the, making sure the stories are being told. Are there any to purchase? Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. 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 Yeah, yeah, yes. yes. They, you can buy them out front here, yeah. And, and I guess There's only one volume, though, right? Only, <clears throat> that's the only book, volume one. Well, volume yeah, two. right. They were. Yeah, there, there's like, there's like, there was like four, there was like four issues that they put into that. And as they were putting that together, they had some stuff left over. So they slipped that fifth yeah. version in. And and yeah, the that's, that's what you'll find. Like this yeah, it, and that's what we did. We just basically copied it. Mm -hmm. Put a little intro in the beginning and yeah, yeah. Any other questions? I think we've come to the end of our talk. Unless you have something more to say. I wanted to close with, uh, with Ralph Newsom. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> so this 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 is a book by this is called The Hellish Life of a Hermit. <laughs> you see that? See that? Now let me open it up. Let me open it up. <laughs> it's all upside down. <laughs> so okay, so you go to the back of it and then open it up and then you find and here's the chapters of a hellish life of a hermit. Number one, chapter one, single bliss. How about that? <laughs> Number two, a thousand times no. <laughs> Number three, not all hermits are bored. 
<laughs> number four, the life we live here. Number five, my own hellish life. And number six, a hermit's fair share. And number seven, why are there all these bachelors? <laughs> so, they're all written in that kind of uh, interesting slant. Thank you. Yeah. Just one like comment, it strikes me when I was a kid, I was just enamored of the Fox Fighter series. Ah, uh, yes. You read that? Yeah. And I never, and then I later on, you know, started to read Kick Poop Pearls and attach those stories to my dad's and ancestors' upbringing. But I never drew that analogy until just now. This is really our Fox Fighter. That is, yeah. a, that is yeah. a really good point because mm -hmm. Fox Fighter was a 70s project. And it continued, Foxfire continued into the 80s and, and, uh, and uh, as long as the guy who was doing them continued to do them. But you're right, this, this was modeled after that, this, this direct contact with, with real people and real stories and getting these stories down and saving them. And, and also crafts and recipes, um, it's just filled with these gems of, of, um, of country wisdom and country craft. And it's just one last comment because I love this stuff, but it strikes me that there's so much value in this local history. Like the, my kids, the kids that are growing up here now, uh, you know, they don't have Chuck Hadfield, Brad Steinmetz as a <laughs> social studies or history teachers, so they're studying world history and American history. But I tell my kids little jewels I learned about from my dad, my grandma, like the grand, the grand staff murder, which took place right next to our farm. And my kids are just, what? <laughs> this is so cool. That happened here. And this is much the same thing. There's a lot of neat history, right? Of course, there is here. Yes. Good yeah. point. And one question about the title for the people I remember. Was that like a nod to Ben Logan? Not really, is it? Well, not from our point of view. No. I, in no. fact, I was trying to think of exactly where the name came from. Uh, it, it, I think maybe it may have come from Bonnie. Bonnie, and yeah. So if Bonnie... From their newspaper. It, it is true that there's, that they, there's a resemblance there, except that yeah. what, what, what is written is much different than what Ben Logan wrote, you know, his own kind sure. of memoirs and stories. And so, there'd be a follow but right, yeah, the, the yeah. river remembers, but that yeah. would be from yeah. here to there that you guys yeah. already did. Yes. That. Yeah. 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 Okay, thank you very much for coming. Thank you.